doesn't mean that they will necessarily be solved in a global way because many nations are not prepared to deal with them even though they recognize them as a problem. So this is the situation which we face. And in order to get at it, I try to analyze a number of international systems that have existed at various stages in history, why they prospered and how they collapsed, what the various elements were, spending a lot of time on the Cold War period and on the American experience with international politics and winding up with, uh, with the contemporary world. Now, uh, much of it then in the debate that any book generates gets absorbed again in the recent political debates. My interest is not to sit in judgment about this or that decision. I'm trying to say we are moving into a new world. What we need above all are concepts to deal with that new world. That you cannot give a good answer unless you ask the right question. And we face in particular not just a change of generations from the Cold War to the post-Cold War period, but also a change in perception which makes it particularly difficult. A change in perception from the generation that grew up from reading to a generation that grows, that grows up learning from viewing. When you form your ideas on the basis of words, you build on concepts, which to be meaningful depend on the relationship to other concepts. When you form your ideas on the basis of pictures, you form your views on the basis of impressions and of moods that can't even be recreated very easily. So you can look back and check what it was that impressed you so much. You take the situation in Bosnia. For 18 months, we have known from the newspapers what was going on. Then one mortar shell hits a marketplace on a Saturday morning and suddenly public opinion gets mobilized and the government goes into action. I don't say this is a criticism. I say that this is a new style of politics that is emerging, a new style of approaching problems, and it is a particular issue at a time when the future is so different from the past so that we need some ideas, concepts of how to get from where we are to where we've never been. It's to this debate that I try to make a uh, contribution because I think in the end we can only learn from history. It's the only laboratory we have. Unfortunately, history only tells you the results of analogous situations. But each generation has to figure out for itself what is analogous. That is not automatically clear. So at any rate, this is the problem that I try to address. And now you will ask me, you can ask me questions on any concrete topic or any other topic that interests you. And I would only like to uh, warn you that I'm a believer in the de Gaulle style of press conferences. <laughs> de Gaulle was of the view that he would not let journalists tell him 
what he should talk about. And so he came with five prepared answers. <laughs> and no matter what the question was, he worked his way through one of the answers. If you're willing to ask questions, I see microphones. Are they supposed to line up at the microphones? Yeah, I think the microphones are so everybody can hear the questions, if you don't mind. That one? Yeah. If they should line up at the microphones. Oh, my God. <laughs> I thought I had escaped you. So please review for us and tell us exactly what happened about the prisoners of war after the, in the Vietnam War and real part in it. The, the question there. is, would I tell uh, exactly what happened to the prisoners of war? Uh, that, of course, is a very sore subject with me because all the people who said, just get out of there and the prisoners will get back and don't worry about the prisoners are now yelling that we didn't do enough to get the prisoners back. Uh, the problem was this. Uh, we did not knowingly leave any prisoners behind. And no American president or secretary of state should ever be accused of, of such a decision. And it stands to reason that President Nixon, who for four years was accused of being a warmonger that he did not have to fight for four years to leave prisoners behind, so that is simply an absurdity. The problem was that after the prisoners came back, and you remember, must remember, we had no authentic information of who was a prisoner, except occasionalists which the North Vietnamese released to opponents of the war, never to the government. So we could never check it that when the prisoners came back, there were a number of anomalies. That is to say, we knew immediately about 60 cases where there had been some information that they had been uh, captured, either through voice contact on the ground or through other indications which led us to believe that there was a possibility that they had been captured. Those cases were raised within two weeks of our receipt of the list. Then there was another set of problems that concerned prisoners in Laos, uh, in which it was even more difficult to find out what the reality had been. We in the Nixon administration, and I'm sure all our successor administrations, went through enormous effort to try to find out what the facts were in the first year or two after the war. When we could have engaged in military re retaliation, we were prohibited by the Congress from engaging in any further military action. And we were deprived of the carrot of economic aid. So all we could do is talk about it. We lost both the carrot and the stick. Now, I personally do not believe that in Vietnam uh, substantial numbers of prisoners were kept behind because I don't see what motive they would have had to keep prisoners behind that they never used. If a year later they had said to us, we found a batch of prisoners and you have to pay us a billion dollars to get them, uh, that would have been something that I would have deeply resented. Uh, but that I could have believed quite consistent with what uh, what they were. So this is what I know about the prisoners. I testified at enormous length before a Senate committee and the Bush administration made available to them the verbatim record of all the negotiations. And I believe that the committee was convinced that if prisoners were left behind, they were left behind in total gross violation of the agreement 
and by the Vietnamese and without knowledge of the United States. Bismarck also said one, woe to the statesmen whose arguments at the end of a war are not as convincing as they were when he ended the war. Uh, and that too is something that we should keep very much in mind. Now in Bosnia, we have two kinds of interests. One is a general interest that disputes should not be settled international dispute should not be settled by force. And we have a moral and humanitarian interest in preventing uh, certain kinds of violence and genocide. Those are legitimate American interests. We do not have a national interest in where the exact dividing lines are in Bosnia nor, frankly, did we have a national interest in contributing to the creation of the state of Bosnia, which I think is at the source of all of these problems, because I don't believe Bosnia has ever in history been a nation. It has been a geographic entity between the various empires and an administrative subdivision of Yugoslavia, of Austria, of the Turkish Empire, and the strange aspect of Bosnia is that its component nationalities, Serbs, Muslims, and Croats, seem to be able to live together, provided not one of them governs. Uh, <coughs> it is, uh, they cannot subordinate themselves to each other. So I believe it would have been much wiser from the beginning to make Bosnia a UN or NATO or European uh, trusteeship and attempt to see and see what happened under those circumstances. Now I am very leery about American military involvement in Bosnia. I recognize our interests. I recognize the pain. I think the administration was correct in what it did about Sarajevo, which was addressed to a specific circumstance uh, and could be solved with a specific proposal. I'm very uneasy about putting 25,000 or any other number of American peacekeepers, or so-called peacekeepers in there, who in a measurable time will become passion, uh, hostages to the passions of the contending parties and face us on an even larger scale with the problem of uh, uh, Somalia even though I have enormous respect for the concerns of people like Margaret Thatcher and others, and though I share their enormous disquiet with some of the methods, with all of the methods that have been used to fight that war. Yes, sir. I'd like to uh, take your view on future Russian foreign policy if Jarnowski were to become president. If who? Jarnowski. Well, you see, with all respect, this is one of those questions which again ties Russian foreign policy to a personality. Uh, I don't think that Zhirinovsky is the cause of Russian nationalism. He's the expression of Russian nationalism. And if a nation has conducted itself in a certain way for 400 years, I draw from it the perhaps unworthy conclusion that this indicates a certain proclivity in that direction. Uh, so therefore, I think that for a variety of reasons, some of them very